Hi, my name is Dr. Kansevoy, and I'm a professor of medicine in University of Medicine School or in University of Maryland School of Medicine and director of therapeutic endoscopy at Mercy Medical Center. And today I will be interviewing uh, Dr. Fateh Bahin, uh, who is an endoscopy fellow at Westmade uh, Hospital in Sydney, Australia, regarding their recent paper. Uh, Dr. Fatah Bahin, can you tell me what prompted you to uh, do research on that issue? Uh, sure. Um, so, wide-field endoscopic mucosal resection of large sessile and laterally spreading lesions of the colon is now becoming a standard of care in the West. It is uh, feasible technically and also a safe um, outpatient day procedure. Um, however, some of the limitations when undergoing resections of such large lesions is intraprocedural bleeding. Um, there have been previous uh, described methods of dealing with this, but they all have inherent limitations. And thus, uh, we were interested in a simple, safe, um, inexpensive and easy to apply technique to overcome this problem. And can you tell for our listeners uh, what is the innovation which you made and which you uh, study in mm. this research? Um, so the, the principle of the study is really um, to utilize the existing um, snare um, that is being used for resection to um, uh, also use it for um, hemostasis. Thus, um, the only innovation really is to not exchange the device but um, have multiple uses of the snare um, for both resection but also intraprocedural bleeding. So you're practically uh, using the same instrument which you cut in order to stop bleeding if it occurs right after you use it for cut purpose? That's correct. Um, the, the modification is that uh, we're simply using the tip of the snare to uh, deliver coagulation for hemostasis. But you also use a special mode, and can you tell us a little bit about this soft coagulation mode which you use uh, to stop the bleeding? Yeah. Um, so modern um, electroprocessor units that are being employed increasingly for endoscopic mucosal resection have um, several modes of, of cutting and coagulation. Um, Conventionally, in our unit, we use um, the um, cut mode to remove the lesion. However, in this particular technique, we switch over to the soft coagulation mode um, for hemostasis. This is where um, we uh, cap the, the uh, output uh, of, of the voltage um, to 80 watts. Um, the, the commercial system that we use was the Irby system, uh, effect for soft coagulation, and this um, allowed for very effective hemostasis. So practically you restricted the upper limit of the current and as long as you are applying it and the tissue get desiccated more and more, the current is not going deeper and deeper and it's getting more and more superficial. Is that correct? That's correct. So utilizing the principles of Ohm's law, uh, which is where uh, voltage is the product um, of, of current and uh, resistance, um, um, when you fix uh, sorry, I've got to retake that. Um, utilizing the principles of Ohm's law, if you fix voltage, then um, uh, as as the uh, current uh, even increases, um, the the resistance increases proportionally, and thus um, deep thermal injury um, is is negated significantly. And there were any side effects or any complication because of this technique. Um, in our cohort of um, 196 uh, patients, um, the uh, comparison between the two groups that had intraprocedural bleeding and no intraprocedural bleeding, there was no statistically significant difference in the periprocedural complications, which we counted as being um, muscularis propria injury or, or deep uh, perforation or hospitalizations or post-procedural delayed bleeding.
So application of the uh, hemostasis with tip of the snare did not cause any damage to underlying tissue. Is that correct? Uh, clinically, that was not the case. Um, and in fact, in the control group, the group of patients who did not have this uh, current of uh, hemostasis use, uh, you had one perforation, but it was not related to the bleeding control. That's correct, yeah. And uh, mm, also, uh, did you use any additional methods of hemostasis in patients who had intraprocedural bleeding? Mm. Uh, yes, we did. So in in um, our cohort of 196 patients with 198 resected lesions, the intraprocedural bleeding rate occurred in um, uh, intraprocedural bleeding occurred in 44 patients, uh, giving a percentage of 24%. Out of those uh, 44 patients, um, uh, snare tip soft coagulation on its own was effective in 40 of those patients, so about 90%. However, in the other four cases, an additional therapy was needed, and um, this was utilizing either coagulating forceps, once again with soft coagulation, or clips. And I understood that if the bleeding was fairly active, if there was a arterial bleeding, you did not attempt it to control it with uh, tip of the snare. You proceed mm. straight with application of endoclip or uh, coagulation forceps. Is that? That's correct. So out of um, uh, so three cases in our group had a very brisk bleeding where um, we've moved straight on to another modality, that's correct. So practically, if you encounter a s uh, very slow uh, capillary bleeding, then you proceed with the snare, and if the bleeding was brisk, then you proceed with another technique. Uh, that's correct. We think that um, snare tip soft coagulation should actually be the first modality for brisk or for slower bleeding. Um, but in very brisk bleeding, an additional modality probably is needed. Thank you very much for this very informative conversation. Thank Hope you. Hope that our listeners will like it too. Thank you.